So now we're going to cover T cell development, the stages by which cells um, originate in the bone marrow, travel to the thymus, and begin their journey um, forming T cells. So we're starting out in the bone marrow, again, with our pluripotent hematopoietic stem cells. These are the cells that give rise to all blood cells, both white and red. And these cells undergo mitosis and their stem cells, so they renew themselves and produce daughter cells. Now, some of those daughter cells could be of the lymphoid precursor, at which point when they divide, they could turn into B cells or they could turn into T cells. Now, the thing about T cell development is um, these cells that are the lymphoid precursors leave the bone marrow and actually enter the bloodstream. This is opposed to B cell development, where these lymphoid precursors would stay in the bone marrow and divide and um, generate B cells in B cell development. But some lymphoid precursors leave the bone marrow, enter the bloodstream, and find their way to the thymus. And this is where most of T cell development occurs in the thymus. So the thymus is a primary lymphoid organ, just like the bone marrow, because it's an organ where uh, cells, immune cells, uh, undergo development. So it's a primary lymphoid organ found in the upper thorax uh, in your chest. And so this structure um, is filled with thymocytes. These are these immature T cells uh, that originated from these lymphoid precursors, had entered the bloodstream, and now they are in the thymus. So the thymocytes are the cells that will hopefully become T cells. We're going to have other cells in the thymus to talk about. There are many epithelial cells in the thymus. We call them thymic epithelial cells. They're going to help um, train the thymocytes uh, during negative selection and during positive selection and give them signals to let them know that they're in the right place for T cell development. You're also going to find macrophages and dendritic cells in the thymus. They're going to help develop the thymocytes into CD4, CD8 cells. They will also phagocytose any um, improperly gene rearranged cells or cells that have to die by apoptosis. And a lot of these thymocytes will die by apoptosis um, if they're self-reactive. So there's a lot of structures in the thymus, which we won't go into, but there are layers of cells and uh, typically referred to as stroma. And we're not going to go into the different regions of the thymus, but they are covered in your book, but uh, I'm not going to require you to know them for this course. Uh, the interesting thing about the thymus is that it, it degrades over time, so it actually uh, becomes more and more non-functional over the course of your life. It uh, both shrinks and becomes replaced by fat. So the epithelial cells die off and get replaced by fat cells. And you would think, well, that would be bad for the immune system, but it turns out that it seems not to be because uh, it appears that the T cells that one generate these, it generates early in life seem to live for a person's entire life. So we're generating a bunch of naive T cells in the thymus and they seem to be either long lived or they're self renewing. It's not actually clear, uh, but it is clear that you can live without a thymus and there are individuals who have a, th a thymectomy uh, if they have, to have their thymus removed due to some damage in their uh, upper chest area uh, you can live without a thymus. If you have your thymus removed as an adult, uh, you actually have a completely normal immune system, which means you must have generated enough naive T cells in your thymus, and they must be living uh, quite a long time uh, in your body, as opposed to naive B cells, those die after about 100 days. So you have to keep making naive B cells throughout your life in your bone marrow. You can't live without bone marrow, but you can live without a thymus. Okay, that's interesting. So we uh, start off with this cell called the thymocyte, and uh, it knows that it's in the thymus because it's going to contact other cells, um, and that's going to trigger uh, T cell receptor development. Interesting thing, uh, this cell lacks the markers that normal T cells have. So a normal T cell would either have CD4 or CD8 on its surface, and these cells lack both of them. So we refer to these cells as double negative thymocytes. They lack CD4, they lack CD8. So you can say they're CD4 negative, CD8 negative. 
So these are double negative thymocytes. And that means that gene rearrangement has not begun yet. So um, what occurs when the thymocyte gets to the uh, thymus is that these thymic stromal cells, so these are some of the epithelial cells that you find in the thymus, will signal to the cell using cytokines. So here we're using the cytokine IL-7, released by these thymic stromal cells, bind the IL-7 receptor on the surface of thymocytes. That's one signal to tell these thymus uh, sites that they're in the right place and to get ready for uh, gene rearrangement. Uh, there are other cells that are uh, present in the thymus that have other molecules on their surface. There's a molecule called the notch ligand, and that molecule, that protein, interacts with a protein on the surface of the thymocyte called the notch protein. So one is a soluble, so IL-7, that's a soluble cytokine that's released. Notch ligand and notch, those are a protein-protein interaction that's actually called a juxtacrine signaling, as opposed to IL-7 releasing in the uh, vicinity of other cells, that's paracrine signaling. But both of these signals are going to tell the thymocyte, I'm in the right place, I've got the instructions, I've got the go signal, so it is time to undergo gene rearrangement. And we start off with the T-cell receptor beta gene. So if you recall from the heavy chain gene and the light chain gene, we talked about during B-cell development. During T-cell development, you've got the gene, the TCR beta gene, in its germline conformation. So you have the many variable regions, many, many diversity gene segments, or many junctional, or I'm sorry, joining gene segments, and a constant region. And what's going to occur here is VDJ recombination, or somatic recombination, or gene rearrangement of the beta gene. So the RAG enzymes act, turn on, they land randomly on RSSs, and cutting and pasting a V to a D to a J to hopefully make a functional open reading frame that will generate a functional beta chain protein. We're also gonna have junctional diversity occurring here. So the enzyme TDT, terminal deoxynucleotide transferase, is on and it is filling in the N nucleotides between the junctions of V and D and D and J. You've also got P nucleotides as well. And this is going to allow this T cell to make a unique and specific beta uh, gene protein for the T cell receptor. Uh, so just like with B cells, there's a chance that you might put in a stop code on or you might be out of reading frame. So yes, it is possible to have non-productive re gene rearrangements. But again, that's okay. You can go to the other beta gene, or you can try another V and another J. Uh, the success rate is actually fairly high uh, for recombination in the beta gene. It's about 80% of the time this occurs, productive gene rearrangement. So all the cells that go through this process are going to generate a unique and specific TCR beta protein. Okay, that's great. So we've got the cell. Uh, that has undergone gene rearrangement in the beta gene. So we're going to call this a pre-T cell. Now, uh, what's interesting is that this cell undergoes mitosis. So now you have many cells that have this T cell receptor beta protein rearranged. And now each of these cells undergoes rearrangement in the TCR alpha gene. So again, looking at that gene in its germline conformation, it's got a lot of V, variable gene segments, joining gene segments, a constant gene segment, and same thing, the RAG enzymes will turn on, uh, cut a random V to a random J, junctional diversity occurs, and there's a 98% chance of producing a, a productive um, alpha chain gene, which will produce a alpha chain protein. Uh, so very high success rate here. Something else that occurs at this stage while alpha gene rearrangement is occurring is the genes for the CD4 and CD8 proteins turn on. And now these cells are making the CD4 protein and the CD8 protein. They make them at the same time. So all of these cells here that are undergoing uh, T cell receptor alpha gene rearrangement, um, we now refer to these cells as double positive thymocytes because they have both CD4 and CD8 on their surface. Now, why is that? Shouldn't T cells have only one or the other? And the answer is yes, they will have to choose 
to be one or the other, and that's going to happen in a later step. But at this point, any every one of these T cells has the potential to be a CD8 positive cytotoxic T cell or a CD4 positive helper T cell. So to allow cells to become anything they want when they grow up, both CD4 and CD8 are turned on. So we're calling these double positive thymocytes. So now what's going to happen to these cells? Um, these cells are, oh, let's go back here. Yep. So now these cells have a functional T cell receptor on their surface made of the alpha chain and the beta chain, and it has some unique and specific variable region that could interact with a peptide. Uh, this cell also has both CD4 and CD8 on its surface. So a number of processes are, will occur after this st step. Negative selection, we want to screen our uh, antigen binding site of the T cell receptor to see, to make sure it's not going to interact and attack our uh, cells with our peptides. There's another process that actually occurs before this called positive selection, which we'll get into in the next video. And then once cells go, once these double positive thymocytes go through positive selection, then negative selection, they will commit to being either a CD4 T cell or a CD8 T cell. And we'll cover these processes in the next few videos.